Good afternoon and welcome to the Sustainable Materials Management webinar series, a joint effort between the National Recycling Coalition and the Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center. My name is Wayne Bowen and I'm the program manager for the Recycling Market Center and I will serve as your moderator today. We'd like to extend a special thanks to Bob Hollis of the Mobius Network for providing the webinar management software for this series and Lisa Ruggiero of the National Recycling Coalition for providing the technical support. Today's webinar focuses on biodegradable materials. Following the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. If you have a question or comment, please use the GoToWebinar dialog box located in the control panel on your screen. You may also use the dialog box to request assistance if you are experiencing technical difficulties during the webinar. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter, David Brooks. David serves as a certifi certification manager for the Biodegradable Products Institute, where he oversees all aspects of the testing and registration process for compostable products. David has 25 years experience as a marketing and sales executive and has worked for companies such as International Paper, Mobile Chemical, BASF, ICI, Warner Lambert Company, Owens Corning, Intermec, Unova, and Cincinnati Machine. Dave is also the owner of SBS Consulting. Mr. Brooks received an undergraduate degree in rhetoric and communications from New York State University of Albany and an MBA from the Marshall Graduate School of Business at the University of Southern California. And with that, I'll turn the program over to Dave. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, present to uh, this seminar series. Uh, today, I'd like to give you a little bit of a background about our organization, uh, the Biodegradable Products Institute. Our mission, uh, which we think is the most important thing that we do, is consumer education and labeling. I'll talk a little bit about our certification process, getting into uh, what we certify to, which is sta the ASTM standard for compostability. I'll then talk a, a little bit about some of the myths about biodegradability. And, but first, I want to start with what I think is a very large, compelling issue for recyclers to be sort of on point. And uh, the history of recycling shows a really great success story. You can look at this curve of the data from uh, the EPA. Um, we've made remarkable progress with things like cargated containers, paper bags, newspapers, cans, and bottles, and um, have gone from virtually nothing over the course of 50 years to a very impressive uh, kind of diversion rate. This is uh, landfill recovery rates. But since then, since about 2005, rates have sort of plateaued. Uh, in 2005, it's 31.6 percent. 2010, it's barely budged to 34.1 percent. So clearly, there's something that's, that needs to be done. So our basic premise is that recycling is not just about reclaiming newspapers or cans or materials, but it's about landfill diversion for a better, higher use of materials. But primarily it means keeping valuable things out of a landfill and out of an incinerator. So by recycling biodegradable products like soiled or wet papers, and most importantly, food scraps, and by uh, keeping those things out of the waste stream, we can significantly, significantly boost U.S. recycling rates and reignite consumers' passions for recycling. So now to see how this is all related, I'll first talk about BPI as an organization, who we are, what we do. I'll then focus on some myths. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, some of the programs that we have. So we were founded in 1999. Um, we currently actually have 150 members as of last week from around the world. And we've independently certified more than 250 compostable product classes and that comprises about 2,500 individual items down to the SKU level. And we've established this a compostable logo program that independently certifies products labeled compostable and making sure that they do, in fact, disintegrate safely in a commercial compost facility. We, our standards are similar to other schemes in Europe from DINCERTCO and DINSOT. Uh, Japan has a separate program. We've experienced about a 500% increase in certification requests, and last year we formed a partnership with NSF International, who is now the official program administrator. 
And because they are a third party administrator, our program is now ISO Guide 65 compliant. So we have a, a very competitive, a, a very uh, comprehensive and a very credible program because we are independent of um, using an independent authority such as NSF. We feel that we, we can provide a, a level of integrity to the program that's uh, unparalleled to any other certification scheme out there. So because of these standards that we've established, we believe that the logo, the VPI compostable logo offers considerable benefits. It's a clear, concise, easy to understand label that can be placed on consumer products. And it's backed by rigorous standards, so it gives consumers an assurance that the marketer's claims are real and valid. And it gives composters assurance that the product will disintegrate safely in a manner consistent with organic materials. Our members comprise a range of different companies that are committed to source separated mixed organics composting. Uh, we span resin and fiber producers that are doing bagasse fiber, molded pulp, and a host of different biodegradable polymers. Uh, we also have converters who independently certify that the products that they base on biodegradable or certified raw materials are in fact biodegradable. And then their distributors and finally their resellers are also committed through a variety of sub-licensing programs. We believe it's very important to track each product as it goes through the supply chain to make sure that no one is adulterating products or is trading on our name and our reputation. So let me talk a little bit more about our certification process and how we work. So back in um, 2002, we established this basic protocol. To become certified, applicants must complete a series of tests, including ASTM D6400, plus a heavy metals FTIR phytotoxicity uh, tests, and at only one of 18 different BPI certified laboratories around the world. Uh, these, these laboratories have been certified by a personal site inspection by us to ensure that they have accurate systems and they, they have a high level of integrity. Uh, we then take company provided test results which are reviewed by independent experts and in this case it's NSF. After those tests are certified, members enter into a license agreement and earn the right to display the BPI logo. We independently monitor and test products in the market including secret shopper programs to verify the product certifications. Our methods and the compostable logo are recognized by composters and municipalities around North America. Our position on materials is agnostic. We don't make the mistake of assuming that a material of natural origin is biodegradable, and no, nor do we assume that a synthetic material is not capable of biodegradation. We let the science decide. I won't read this, but this gives you an uh, appreciation for the level of detail that we ask of each of our customers. We enter into non-disclosure agreements and we have formulation information about most of the products that we certify. And it's a very high level of trust between us and each of our members. But it's also a high, it shows you the level of commitment that our members are faced with and want to have to bring, to bring forward a safe product to the marketplace. So we'll talk a little bit more about some of the standards and labeling that are out there. Most people think that products, most people, when you talk about a biodegradable product, they think that the product will break down on its own within a year or less. That's just everyone's expectation. And they want to believe that products will just go away and in a manner that's consistent with how they dispose of the trash right now, either in a backyard or in a landfill. Um, but Landfilling and biodegradation are just are, are ideas that go well together in a consumer's mind, but they're not desirable in the mind of the EPA. So we believe what we're really after and what, what's inherent in ASTM D6400, which is for plastic products, and ASTM D6868, which is for paper-based or paper laminated with a, a compostable plastic, we believe that the intent is just what consumers expect, and that is complete disintegration by microbes that exist in a, a compost facility and in communities that have access to commercial composting, leaving no residues or nothing toxic, and within a 90 to 180 day span, something that's realistic and meaningful for the disposal. And that's, in essence, what we try to ensure, and that's what we try to enforce with all of our members. 
But some companies use the ASTM test to talk about um, the compliance. And there are different levels of ASTM testing, as I've tried to indicate with this slide, that sometimes a test method is merely a recipe for uh, how to conduct a test. But really, in our lines, in our line, ASTM is has a, a higher a higher level of test, which is a specification, which is a pass fail test. And you'll see over here, some people will try to use ASTM methods, and they'll quote things like D5511 and say it's landfill degradable. And we'll talk a little bit about that next uh, about myths, but most of our um, when you look at the hierarchy of what we're talking about, we, we enforce the pass-fail criteria, which is the most str stringent in terms of ASTM specifications. So simply uh, talking about ASTM is not, not sufficient in our minds. You have to really be very specific about what you're testing to. So as a condition of licensing, we review the marketing claims by our members to ensure that they are properly qualified. Uh, it's essential that marketing labels that use our logo and use the word compostable also include the following qualification language. This, product pack, this plastic product meets ASTM D6400 and is intended to be composted in a municipal or commercial facility operated in accordance with the best composting management practices. Check to see if such a facility exists in your community. It is not intended for backyard comp composting. This language is carefully and deliberately chosen uh, to address guidelines established by the FTC. So here's some examples of what we believe are responsible and frankly irresponsible claims by some manufacturers. And this is an example of what we do to, to enforce uh, adherence to this responsible marketing standard where a applicant or a member uses the logo and then clearly and prominently right next to that logo it qualifies exactly what we mean when we say the word compostable. A lot of other companies, though, try to just use buzzwords and a lot of phrases that really in, in don't mean much and are not properly qualified. So we, we think we're, we're taking a very conservative approach, but the right approach to making sure that the claims are believable, accurate, and ultimately are going to be trusted by consumers. The, uh, there's a lot of confusion and abuse because of uh, the, the public's willingness to believe green marketing claims. So states have become very active. Um, for instance, uh, this year, California has banned the use of the term biodegradable on all plastic products. And I've cited the actual um, source there for uh, the law if people want to read it. But the, the relevant point is of this language. A person shall not sell a plastic product in this state that is labeled with the term biodegradable, degradable, or decomposable, or any form of those terms, or in any way imply that the plastic product will break down, fragment, biodegrade, or decompose in a landfill or other environment. Compostable is accepted as long as it's accompanied with a third party, a, a testing organization, or a reference to a uh, organization that uses ASTM D6400 or the European standard. So long term, I think that many other states will follow California's lead, and this is all um, driven by what the FTC is pushing for in their green guidelines. So I want to shift gears and talk a little bit more about the, um, the term biodegradable and some of the myths that are associated with that. When most consumers um, hear that term, they think it's something that's inherently good. That's the way nature does it, so it must be good. But biodegradability is an abstract contingent term. It requires some sound scientific definitions and qualifications to make sure that you really understand and are, know what you're talking about. And unfortunately, many companies take advantage of consumers' good intentions or, or lack of good regulations. So here's some examples of some myths and what we think are some, some ways to kind of understand, how to understand that. The first kind of claim that a lot of people will talk about is how additives can somehow transform a, a, pro, a, a pro plastic product and make it magically biodegrade. Um, we've tested more than 50 products that have made those kind of claims, and in all instances, we've not seen any additive that can magically transform 
a regular plastic into a compostable product that will meet ASTM D6400. So here's some examples. Um, you know, products that are made with traditional non-biodegradable resins. So if the, the base material is polystyrene or polypropylene or polyethylene, when a manufacturer starts claiming its products are made with those materials and transformed by some sort of special additive, it's probably an indication that something um, is, is unusual and untoward. Uh, we think this is especially true if the additive has sort of an action-packed pseudo-scientific prefix like oxo or photo or pro or omni in front of degradable. Uh, there's another warning sign is that when products make may, vague or meaningless claims such as 100% biodegradable or made with renewable, renewable materials, made with corn, environmentally safe, these are products that are claims that are very vague and really can't be substantiated. And then finally, anyone that, that talks about meeting ASTM, but they don't go into what specific specification they've tested to, or worse, they claim that they've met ASTM methods, which is just simply saying that they've followed a recipe, but not really telling you if the product failed or passed a test. So after a time, many companies that are using degradables have tried them and found they really don't work as, as advertised. And other companies that continue to, to use those additives are now being sued by governmental agencies because the marketing claims just are not substantiated. And as you heard in the language from California, that's exactly what they're trying to crack down upon is vague and unsubstantiated marketing claims. So when companies do attempt to offer proof they sometimes play fast and loose with the underlying science. One popular catch me if you can kind of trick is something that we call the biodegradability by extrapolation standard. And the logic goes something like this is that, you know, for New Year's, I, I've lost one pound on my diet. And so I'm going to extrapolate and conclude that I'll lose 30 pounds by June 1st. And my wife especially thinks that there may be some reasons to be skeptical about my extrapolation. But that's the essence of what people are talking about. So here's how the, the extrapolation ploy works when you're talking about materials. Um, manufacturers will, will talk about um, a small amount of biodegradation data, usually a small window, and then strongly imply that the process will continue in a linear fashion to indicate complete biodegradation. So if it takes 10 days to reach 15%, then at 40 degrees, it'll be completely degraded. All degradable additives make, uh, makers' claims are based on that theory of extrapolation. And you can't extrapolate a biological process. It's scientifically unsound, and natural processes are rarely linear. When microbes run out of stuff to eat, they just stop. The effect is observed as a plateau in the production of gas, either CO2 or methane, depending on what you're testing. And so what's happening here is that you have the control material, cellulose, and an actual certified material plateauing very nicely after the test is run for the full 40 days. But after we get through our extrapolation phase, the material just plateaus. And what's happening here is that the actual materials that were biodegradable that were blended into the traditional plastic, all that's consumed by the microbes. And what's left is basically plastic that the microbes won't touch. And that's measured very convincingly as long as you run the test the proper amount of time. So Enso is one company that makes an environmentally friendly bottle that's called the uh, Aquamantra plastic bottle. And it's got a special oxo degradable resin. So here's one statement from their website is during the ASTM biodegradation testing on the bottles, biodegradation shows 11% in 30 days. So let's look at their data. And here's the other quote is that it becomes obvious that biodegradation has occurred. Biodegradation appears to be linear. There is no significant deceleration at the end of the first 15-day test period. The degradation will apparently continue in a linear fashion. Um, so we decided to check. And we sent an ENSO water bottle to a very reputable lab, and we verified those results with an independent reviewer. The test data that we obtained doesn't support any biodegradable claim. And after 60 days, we measured only 4.47% biodegradation and essentially a plateau. And so you, you can see 
cellulose works very well, but with polyethylene, there's no fire degradation. And the only thing that degraded was some additives that were added to the actual bottle. At least that's our speculation. And the, the recycling industry also seems to take issue with degradable additives in PET bottles, which is particularly troublesome if you're trying to then make durable goods or products out of those uh, recycled materials. So for a lot of reasons, additives that are put into regular plastics and they're using pseudoscience to try and prove something, uh, we've never really found anything that's close to the, um, the standard that, that we try to enforce. So this myth is a, is a little bit of a tricky one. Um, first, certain products do in fact biodegrade in an environment other than compost. That's um, anaerobic digestion. And yes, there is an ASTM test to measure if something can be digested. But these two half-truths don't add up to an unimpeachable argument. So let me explain why. Digestion rarely happens outside of our stomachs. In uh, a 1992 book called Rubbish, uh, I think hopefully people might recognize uh, Professor William Rathje, who wrote about excavating landfills and discovering the infamous mummified hot dog and 50-year-old still readable newspapers. His work helped illustrate a poorly understood fact. Since the early 1970s, the EPA policy is to prevent biodegradation in the landfill through daily ground covering to prevent moisture from getting out the trash. So consumers are faced with an inconvenient truth. Very little biodegrades in a landfill, and when it does happen, it usually does so by accident. The, the, the issue is that putrescible trash should really not be landfilled, and that uncontrolled decomposition creates methane, which is, if not captured, will create huge uh, issues for uh, greenhouse gases. There have been some studies, and I, I can send the link out a little bit later to the actual study, but um, landfills are responsible for 16% of methane emissions and about 30% of the methane gas generated in landfills comes from discarded food. And that process also creates liquid leachate, which can damage local aquifers. So for a lot of reasons, biodegradable wastes really should not be sent to the landfill if there's a meaningful way to kind of prevent that from happening. So the next myth is that somehow products that are natural are inherently good and things that are synthetic are somehow always bad. So product made from natural resources have a role to play in a better environment but consumers may be confused that something natural in its origin will behave naturally in its disposal. Take, for example, Coke's innovative plant bottle. It's actually made from a PET resin that's derived from natural feedstocks. But the bottle itself is chemically indistinguishable from regular PET bottles derived from petroleum. So while it's an excellent candidate for recycling, it's a terrible candidate for composting. And products certified by the USDA as biopreferred may help utilize natural feedstocks but that doesn't automatically ensure that they will disintegrate in a compost facility. The, alter, the alternate is true. We have tested and verified that some synthetically derived polymers meet ASTM D6400. That means they can compost completely and safely in a managed commercial compost environment. These examples are some of the reasons why the compostable label is of value. We base our certification decisions on objective scientific evidence verified by independent third parties. We do not rely on commercial claims to manufacturers alone. So here's sort of an example of this kind of breakdown between bio-based and synthetic materials. And you can see here that certain polymers, cellulose, bagasse, polylactic acid, PHA, PBS, are in fact biodegradable, and they're all of natural origin. However, BASF markets a product that's actually a copolyester, which in fact is completely biodegradable. And certain polypropylenes and polyesters can have bio-based feedstocks and yet be not biodegradable. They are completely compatible with plastics recycling. So there's some great reading on the March uh, 2012 edition of Chemical and Engineering News. There's a link on our website that you can download a free reprint of that. And it gets into this issue about what is in fact biodegradable and it's it 
it's a gray area. There's not uh, a clear delineation between natural and synthetic. So here's some implications. You, you can see here, here's the plant bottle. Even though it's 30% bio-based, it's completely recyclable. Here's a product that is a clear PLA, and here's a product that's made from a synthetic material, but they're completely compostable. What we have here, though, is sort of the, the, the odd duck that is only partially recyclable, and it's commingled with organic material, and that organic material biodegrades at a compost facility, but it leaves behind synthetic fragments and residues. And for those reasons, a lot of those products are really not compatible with either recycling or with composting. And so you kind of question why, why they exist in the first place. And finally, um, as Bernie Madoff will tell you, you really need to audit the books once in a while to verify that the numbers that you're being presented are accurate. And so we, we always want to make sure that people trust the data, but then take steps to verify that. So we always ask our, our members and consumers to question vague general statements about degradability, uh, look for specific ASTM test procedures and specifications to be wary when you're presented with methods, and to demand certification, to demand some sort of proof to back up those claims. And that's why we're providing on our website a list of all of our members and approved product categories. And this, later this year, we'll be publishing a item level catalog of all those products. And if all else fails, you can also just call us at 888-BPI-LOGO and we can provide um, verification of exact products. So I want to then just turn towards how we think this fits in with establishing greater recycling goals and to kind of restart recycling. So we'd like to look at composting as a equivalent to recycling and to focus on some of the things that are maybe impractical to recover. So for the last 50 years we focused on relatively easy to recover wastes so like source separated targeted boxes and paperboard, rigid containers like cans and bottles, newspapers, and lately we've included leaf and yard waste. As a side note, leaf and yard waste composting started in earnest from the mid-60s and almost 60 percent of these materials have been diverted from landfills. And it took less than 15 years to achieve that 60% landfill diversion goal from, uh, from yard waste. On the other hand, you have some of the laggards. And these are products that, for one reason or another, are just really tough and difficult to, to recycle. And you can see the average diversion rates for these things are very, very low compared to the things that are easy to recover. Uh, you know, the EPA says we dispose of 3.5 million tons of tissues and paper towels each year. And probably for obvious reasons, we can see why it's, none of it's being recycled. There's, there's a certain amount of a yuck factor that's associated with the things on the right-hand side. That's because they're contaminated with either with moisture or with food or other types of, of bodily fluids. So now, if you look at these materials that are not recyclable, but you look at them in a, sort of a different way, and you see that they're actually completely com compatible with composting. And we already have a vibrant infrastructure of municipal composting that handles up to 20 million tons of organic materials already. And when you add in 34 million tons of food waste that consumers discard each year, it becomes a very large number, and it becomes something that's very worthy of, of tackling and targeting to help um, get these things out of landfills and to start counting as recycling. So this chart is sort of a, a, a way to get at that number. And we, we looked at the audit to talk about how much food scraps is currently being landfilled. And it's, it's an astonishing number, 34.7 million tons. And then you add in a lot of the other things. And we've made some assumptions what we think are conservative assumptions of the papers and the box board and newspapers and other wastes that are biodegradable but not being recycled for some reason. Some of it might be collection problems, but we think part of the reason is because a lot of these products are contaminated in use or commingled with other household organic waste and makes it very impractical to recycle them, but very practical to compost them. And when you 
add those, those products, the 52.4 million tons of biodegradable compostable wastes that are impractical to recycle but very easy to compost, you, you boost your recycling rates by almost 50%. And we think that's a compelling message that can really help get people behind composting in a big way. So the biggest problem now that as we see it is that there's a contamination problem. And we think that compostable products are part of a, a real big solution here. So you have about 50 million tons of organic wet paper, wet wax corrugated, inedible spoiled food that are all clean compostable feedstock. Except that it's commingled with approximately 2 million pounds, 2 million tons of non-degradable plastic and packaging waste. And that plastic that can't be used for sanitary reasons can't be recycled since it's commingled with foods and oils and greases and water. And it's roughly 5% by weight that's holding the rest of that trash hostage, not allowing it to be composted or really done anything with because it's all commingled. If you replace those products with a compostable alternative, you now allow all of that waste to be compatible with mixed organic composting. So we think that thinking and speaking about recycling as a tool for landfill diversion, not merely materials reclamation, is essential to reinvigorating national interest in recycling programs. Composting is recycling, it's just that the reclamation loop is a bit wider than glass bottles or aluminum cans. Through composting we can target a huge fraction of recyclable wastes that are going to landfills and incinerators. And composting has the added benefit of being a proven low capital intensive technology with sustainable economics, so long as the end product is safe, clean, and free from plastic contaminants. And keeping the, the, the humus, the compost end product, free from plastic contamination is where certified compostable products come in. We have created and enforced the standards that help keep compost feedstocks clean. We create the necessary trust factor between waste, waste generators and waste processors. And our solutions enable innovative programs that have dramatic impact on organics collection rates. There are two examples. One I'd like to talk about is uh, something that happened in Ontario, Canada. And this is where 4.3 million households are using certified compostable bags. After one month, the, uh, this is a, a 2009 study, and by using B, BPI certified compostable plastic bags versus paper bags, we were able to increase the capture of food waste by a factor of almost three. 77% of the program participants switched over to using the compostable plastic liner. And it had you know, huge impacts in terms of the consumer participation rate and acceptance rate. There was a lot of benefits to consumers of just containing liquids and odors, preventing punctures and tears. Haulers liked the fact that the bags were very easy to identify and uh, clearly labeled. They were translucent so they could see if there was contaminant there and, and refused to take things if there was obvious products in there that were not compostable. Um, they were weather resistant so the bags didn't tear or break if there was an overnight rain. Composters like the bags because essentially a compostable plastic bag doesn't need to be opened and it doesn't need to be uh, filtered out at the end of the compost operation. It, it simply disintegrates with all the other organic waste and it leaves no synthetic residues and nothing toxic in the waste stream. So it was a real labor savings and a way to ensure that the compost would be free of plastic contamination. The other program I, I, I did not mention uh, was a innovative program that we're seeing um, out in Minnesota from a company called Blue Bag Organics which is using blue tinted BPI certified bags to collect commingled household waste and then that goes to a MRF, and at the MRF, uh, workers there can easily separate out organics for separate composting. So it's another way where it's, it's a practical solution where compostable plastics really enable something and allows a large fraction of the waste stream to be cleanly composted and separated. And with that, um, I'm ready to answer any questions. All right, thank you, David. We're now going to field some questions for our presenter.
Again, if you have a question, please enter them onto the GoToWebinar dialog box. And uh, we have a few already. And this one is more of a comment concerning the ASTM standard of the 90 to 180 days uh, of compost, composting of the material. Most compost systems use systems that are between 45 and 60 days. So I guess the comment is the there's a bit of a disconnect between uh, some composting sites and the, the length of the breakdown period. Yeah, it, it does vary. Uh, so the the numbers that I was quoting was just basically showing the widest possible berth. Um, I think in the, the test specifications for 6400, the test has to be run until there's a, a, a you know, that plateau phase that we talked about. I think it's allowed to run up to 180 days. The, the main point is that the consumer's expectation for what's compostable has to be kind of consistent with just common sense and their own experience. And if you're talking about stuff that'll, you know, biodegrade in five or 10 years, that's not meaningful. And that's, that's not a, a solution. So whether it's 45 days or 180 days, the point is it's consistent with other organic material like bark or hardwoods, which might not biodegrade as quickly as paper or cellulose. Okay, thank you. Uh, this question deals with the uh, any data or studies on the breakdown of material landfills. Uh, do you have any references or can you quote any studies? Um, well, are we talking about the, the there is there is a breakdown of the organic fraction. Is that what the question was asked? I believe so, yes. Yeah. Uh, I believe it was uh, Dr. Mort Barlaz from uh, the University of North Carolina that actually did some studies that talked about organic wastes that break down and the amount of methane that it produces. Uh, it's it's quite substantial, and um, the problem is that um, you know if if it's uncaptured, it presents a problem um, for you know leaking into the environment. It's and it's quite a potent greenhouse gas. So um, I'll, Wayne, I'll, I'll look for the exact link to some of that information, but I believe it was um, uh, Professor Ballars at uh, UNC that um, actually did that work. Okay, thank you. This question uh, is concerning utensils. Are there any forks, spoons, or knives that are truly compostable? If so, which ones are they? <laughs> we, we, we publish a list on our website. It's uh, bpiworld.org. And um, if you look down, I think it's the third link on the left-hand side, and it'll show you a, a list of all of the manufacturers that we have certified. Um, I believe there's at least 15 different companies that sell certified compostable utensils. And uh, it's not just the utensils, but it's also all the, the other food service packaging items, such as drink lids, straws, stirrers, uh, containers, trays, uh, coffee drinking cups, the uh, sleeves that go around the hot drinking cups. Uh, all these products have substitute, they have uh, compostable substitutes for plastic. And so a lot of the food service operations that want to get involved in the zero waste movement are starting to use these products and, and are quite successful with them. Okay, uh, this is a question I can answer if you can't, David. Yeah. Can windrow composting handle large-scale food waste composting? I I don't know. Uh, a lot depends upon the, the the permitting that's involved and uh, the type of turning equipment that's involved. Um, if you have some some more specific information, be my guest. Yes, I would agree with that. It it depends on the the operation and the, a lot of factors such as the recipe. You know how much percentage of food waste is introduced. Uh, and the carbon involved, turning methods, uh, things like that. So yes, I think it can be done. I've, I've seen it done uh, in, in, in particularly in Pennsylvania. We, um, we fund a, a, a companion site to the BPI. It's called findacomposter.com. And if you go to that site, you'll, you'll be able to search for composting facilities that have self-identified that they will actually accept vegetative waste or food waste and things like that. And uh, there's at least 250 that are easily handling food waste right now. 
so it's it, it's not your typical leaf and yard waste. There's some extra skill that's involved, um, and if it's you know, it, a lot depends on on local issues. But there's a a big push, I think, to to look and say, well, what how can we handle more of these kind of things there? So it, it's a matter of time, but I think a lot of composters are starting to recognize that there's some some value in taking in the food for the extra nitrogen that it provides to the compost. And they're very anxious to do that, but they're a little bit hesitant because there's a concern about the plastic fragmentation. Okay, this one is asking for your thoughts on the growing number of compostable products being manufactured, which do not capture any organic material whatsoever, such as clothing, packaging, ink cartridges, etc. We really want uh, the products to end up in our composting facilities. No, yeah, that's that's I I didn't have I, I in a separate presentation when um, we give presentations to product manufacturers, we have sort of a, a, a do be don't be kind of list, and the the basic thing is we're we're not looking to transform every single plastic product into a compostable product. A compostable toner cartridge really doesn't make any sense. Compostable makeup containers don't make much sense, but compostable food service items that are contaminated with oils and grease and food and commingled with a lot of that food waste really aren't being recycled, but they could easily be composted. And so we're looking for applications that provide a, a an unlocking mechanism and preventing the blocking of food waste composting. We're not looking to replace all plastics. Okay, good. Uh, this question uh, is requesting any, are there any legal actions in California or Minnesota from the laws that were passed there? Any challenges? Uh, I'm not aware of any right now under the new law. There was some action, I think, a while ago. Last year, uh, one of the bottle manufacturers was uh, being uh, sued because of uh, inaccurate claims. And now, the, but but it wasn't under the the labeling laws. The labeling laws are, are very strict, and we hope it will put an end to a lot of this frivolous uh, marketing claims. Um, it, you know, the, the the word biodegradable is almost, you know, it, it, it's it's almost meaningless unless you really qualify. Well, what do you mean by that? Where will it biodegrade? How long will it take? What test method or what test specification did you run to prove that it will biodegrade? And if you don't really qualify it with science, it, it, it's really, it is meaningless. What are BPI's strategies or plan to encourage slash convert more standard recycling collection programs to include, to include organics? Uh, you know, getting out there and, and telling a lot more people about it. it it's, it's starting to happen already uh, in, in a lot of communities. Wall Street Journal about a little bit over a year ago ran a great article that talked about large cities like Portland, Oregon, Austin, Texas, San Diego, San Francisco that are hitting diver landfill diversion rates in the, the 60 to 70 percent range by including mixed organics composting. So there's, there's a lot of communities, Portland, Oregon especially, they've cut back on, on curbside collection of regular trash to almost bi-weekly because there's so little volume because everything else is being intensively recycled. And there's a lot of communities you know, around the world that are successfully doing this. People want to do this. And people, they, they, just a matter of education, and it's a question of a couple of concerned citizens asking their town managers or their county managers, why not? We've got existing yard waste facilities, and we wa all want to do this as a community. Why can't we do this? And that's enough. More people need to ask, why not? Because I, th and I think once they start doing that, they'll see, I can take my recycling rates from the mid-30s to the, the mid fifties. And that's, that's a great feeling. This question uh, states, why have you decided not to use the term biocompostable for BPI certified products would seem less confusing. I, well, I would, I would disagree. <laughs> I'm not sure biocompostable is, is any less or any clearer than just saying compostable. What, what other types of compostable would there be? This is probably my, my, if I was talking directly with that person. There, there are 
there are certain small uh, pilot projects that are doing anaerobic composting, uh, digesters and things like that. But for the most part, when you're talking about composting, you're talking about aerobic composting. Right. Can the material as used for blue bag, blue bag, plastic bags be used to create other products besides bags? Maybe with added hardeners or resins. Not sure if I understand. Uh, and as long as all of those additives or resins were also biodegradable, certainly. Uh, you know, there's lots of People are using uh, the, the bag material themselves in, in a lot of very innovative and creative ways for certain types of packaging, for certain types of um, mulch films for uh, gardening is one great example where there's um, a move now to use certified compostable films to help with um, mulching um, to make sure that, you know, it's a great labor savings that you're not having to collect plastics that are put on fields covered with dirt you can now just kind of plow it under and know that it will, it will biodegrade safely in the soil. So it's the same basic film material that's used in the bag, but it's just used on a larger scale in, in a, uh, and it's an application that makes sense because polyethylene that's covered with dirt really is impractical to wash and clean and enough so it can be recycled. You might have covered this, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway. You mentioned that BPI World on the website includes a list of produce products or manufacturers, I believe this would be more useful to send to a client or a caterer asking them to purchase the products listed through your, through your site, list products by company, brand name, etc. cetera. Uh, short answer is yes. Uh, we are act, we're in the final stages of testing that capability. Um, I think I alluded to that before where we have more than 2,500 SKUs uh, available. A lot of our manufacturers we have certified in the past at, at classes of products. So we'll talk about their their cups. But in reality, they're selling 15 different cups. So we're asking all of our members to provide us with a list of all the SKUs of all of their products. And we're publishing that. We'll, we will be publishing that on our website as a resource for composters and for the purchasers to basically go in and say, Mr. Purchasing Manager, buy these specific products. So it's, it's a pretty big task, but we think that it's a valuable service to the industry to provide that as, as an information service. And as pro new products are certified or as products are um, you know, discontinued, that, that information can be changed on a monthly basis. I believe you touched on this before, but I'll, I'll state this one too. What are your thoughts on composable plastics in the shape of bottles? Uh, this person thinks it's too confusing for consumers and processors. Yeah, I, it, it's a tough one. I, we don't have specific, you know, we try not to get involved in judging the application category because we're really, we're trying to measure and certify that products will be compostable. We figure that the marketplace will kind of decide for itself if it really needs those types of products. Um, and but we you know whether the bottle is compostable or not we, we do a lot of up upfront work and consultation with the the applicant to ask them why they really want it to be composted um, you know and are they do they understand that really it's it's meant for products that can't really be recycled and we're not looking we don't want people to use the compostable logo as sort of a a, a you know, decoration you know to, you know we don't want them to to we want them to be committed to composting because they've tried recycling and they're not achieving the goals that they want to, to receive. And again, you, you touched on this briefly. Could you discuss the tug of war between composting and the desire by some to put this in a landfill specifically to collect the methane for energy? I, I don't know enough about methane to energy. I, I just think that, you know, while that's a really noble pursuit, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense if you can turn it into something valuable that, you know, it's sort of like you look at the, the, the waste hierarchy in terms of the highest best use for materials. And I think it's better for food scraps. But if you can't give it away to people who are hungry and you can't feed it to animals, compost it before you send it to the landfill and hope that it gets turned into methane. There, there's a lot of, you know, it's, it's not a slam dunk. 
Um, rather than sending it to a landfill, it's probably better if you want to recover the, the methane just to look at it at a community anaerobic digester versus sending it to a landfill. You know, if, if the landfill if the landfill is not designed specifically to be actively managed for um, methane extraction, that would be another question. You know, in all communities, can you guarantee that you're not going to have a leachate issue? You're not going to have a leakage issue. It's really, I, I would rather see communities invest in an anaerobic digester than to send it to the landfill just because it's a little more convenient. Do you know what the difference is in the cost of compostable products versus non-compostable service wear? Um, in general, I guess. Yeah, I, I don't know specifically. Probably you're looking at a 1x or 2x, you know, kind of factor. Uh, they're, they're more expensive than plastics. Um, if you then look at how you can handle your waste differently, you know, here in the Northeast, landfill tipping fees and carting fees are quite expensive. And so if you're now enabled, you, you're able to now send your wastes to a compost facility, which tipping fees are, are a lot less, that's, that's kind of a, a you know, the, the negligible cost of spending a, a penny more for a fork versus, wow, all my trash now I can save, you know, two thirds of the cost. Um, and then there's the, the, the factor about being able to tell your customers, I'm now landfill free. I'm now making a commitment not to send, to recycle all my trash. How many more people would dine at your restaurant if they knew that you made a commitment to recycle 100% or to recycle everything that was practically recycled as opposed to just carting off to a landfill. And so it's, it's not a simple question to say looking at the cost of a fork, but it's, it's what did that fork unlock for you in terms of how you run your business. Uh, this question deals with uh, organic farm status. Uh, some certifying agencies do not allow commercial composters to accept compostable plastics of any kind. and and has to do with their certifications and they do cite one example northeast organic farming association yeah i'm i'm not really sure about the the status of that but i know that that our position has been because it's completely biodegradable and it, that it how it was made is really of less importance as to how it behaves after it's disposed and so if if the compost that comes out of a mixed organic facility has been tested and certified and it's free of synthetic residues it really shouldn't matter where it where it goes it should be just as as acceptable so i i, I don't know the specifics about certain types of of organic farmers having uh you know their own specific uh, standards but as a general principle you know our position is it's much more important to look at the safety of the compost as opposed to making judgments about the individual products that might be in the waste stream. Okay, I think that's that's all the questions for now. Uh, again, thank you, David, for for a great presentation and and great answers. Um, this webinar, like all the webinars in this series, they have been recorded and are available on both the National Recycling Coalition and Recycling Market Center websites. A few questions did ask that. Is, is this available for, for viewing? And some uh, actually didn't have audio, so this uh, oh recording will be made available, both audio and video. And there was a few seconds there, David, that we lost your audio. so. Uh, through the editing process, we could probably dub that back in uh, if it's not understandable regarding that slide. So again, thank you for joining us, and we hope you'll join us for next month's webinar scheduled for Tuesday, February 19th at 1.30 Eastern Time. Uh, have a good day.